One of our community elders, personal mentor of mine, the Reverend Rabbi Cohen, is going to take us through this journey here at Cape Coast Dungeon. Rabbi. Rabbi, uh, you're welcome. It is a pleasure to greet you, take you on this journey here this evening. We don't call it a tour, we call it an experience. And that's exactly what it is. I understand that your journey today was to a St. Manso coming here in the evening, and it's significant, because when many of our ancestors were brought here on this historical trek, it was in the evening that I arrived here in the darkness, under the cover of darkness. So you having journeyed to one of the last places that they were able to go to, to have their last bath, and having gone through that process chronologically, and come down here this evening, has set the pace for you spiritually to go through this pilgrimage, through this journey, this experience. So I'm going to be your guide through here, and I'm going to try my best to actually house the spirit of our ancestors. We're going to invoke the past. We're going to summon the future, all into the present. So open up your mind to this experience, and we invite the ancestors to take us on this journey. So once again, you're welcome. Again. It being spoken, he didn't mention or invoke the name Castle, although that's what most of the history books label this as. But he invoked the aloe, the word dungeon, because the experience of our ancestors were in these dungeons. And that's why we invoke that terminology. At times, we we'll interchange it with fort, between fort and dungeon, and when necessary, we might make reference to castle. But we do that very reluctantly, because castle invokes once upon a time, they live happily ever after. The castles and boats, the presence that royalty may have been present here, kings and queens, the princes and princesses. But this was not such. Military garrisons were here. We're entering into the portals, we go into the courtyard, and the courtyard, we will do a brief invocation of our ancestral spirits, the spirit of the Almighty for having blessed us to come on this journey because we realize it's not just by your own choice that we're making this journey. We always say to any of us whose ancestors were taken away from here and we're able to make it back here because we ourselves were chosen. So although we play a part in having chosen to come here and take that decision, we recognize that it is the Almighty and the ancestors themselves that chose to come here at this time at this moment. So we want to make a circle here. What we call the circle of invocation. We give thanks and praise to the creator of the universe, the power and the source of all beings and all living, and to the spirit of our great African ancestors, those who chose to live and not die those who died and those who suffered. Those who chose to live and not die. Those who chose life and not death. And because of that choice, we are and we live. And we give thanks and praise to them. We give thanks and praise for them for living and having the hope that they would one day return back to this land, to the land of their forefathers and their foremothers. And although they did not experience that and the physicalness of their body, we are the embodiment of their spirit and alive today. And we give that thanks in this circle. We invoke their spirits here today, that they may guide us to this journey, that they in fact may take us on this journey, that this experience may be real, that we travel back to the past through the narrative of what we're about to go through and the places that we will see and that we will feel, and that we summons the future into this moment, this present moment, that we have both the past, the present, and the future. We ask for their blessings, we ask for their continued guidance, and we actually thank them, thank them, thank them for being who they were and who we are, and that we are one in spirit here today. Amen, Ashe. So we're standing right here in the courtyard of the Cape Coast Fort and Dungeon, and 
this particular fort was built, started to be built by the Swedes around 1654. It is not the oldest on the coast here. The oldest is actually in Elmina. That was built in 1482. It actually, those of us who come from the West, we're inundated with the history of Columbus. And we hear Columbus a lot. Uh, no one tells us that Columbus actually came to these Western shores here. Actually visited the Elmina fort before it actually was built. It was part of those who were concocting the idea of the riches that were in West Africa. I mention that because when we speak of his name, they talk about the journey that he made in 1492 to the Americas. But all of us who grew up in the school systems and the curriculums and the syllabuses in the, in the United States school system were never told about how he made that journey to the West in his detail. I say the detail because if any of you Google or if you ever heard of the term the Nino brothers, it was a family of four brothers. And legend has it that their father was actually from Malmina. And he was taken from these shores when he was very young to Portugal. And he sired four sons in Portugal. And the oldest son, Alfonso Nino, was the owner of the Nina ship. The younger brother, um, Pedro, was the captain of the Santa Maria. They were navigators and they were shipbuilders. And they actually ended up being named the captain of the seas and the shores by Queen Isabella of Spain. And even though the history books say that she gave Columbus the fortune of the last of the Moorish kingdoms that were conquered there to take that journey, they have erased out of history the role that these African men played. We've heard in some history books that there were some Moorish navigators there, but we're never told their identity and where they come from. I mentioned them today because we're in Ghana, we're in West Africa, and we're close to Elmina. And these castle forts, dungeons, have a connection together in their history. And although we're here, I can't tell this story without telling that story because this fort was built 180 years after the one in Elmina. This fort was built when the slave trade was at its height. And even though the Swedes started to build it, eventually it was the English that took it over. And the English history is the history that is mainly made here. And the English have possessed this fort actually all the way up into Ghana's independence. And that's why when we go into the dungeons here today, we'll go into real dungeons. If we were to go into Elmina, we would not go into real dungeons. And actually, you see these storehouses on the side here. Elmina Fort is built where our ancestors were kept in these storehouses. They weren't descended into dungeons like we will go into in the male dungeon and the female dungeon. But at the time when the Dutch were controlling Elmina, eventually they ended up selling the Elmina um, Fort uh, to the English without any indigenous participation. But you see, it also links up with the spirit, I mean, with the story and the narrative of the diaspora, because for those of us who remember, New York used to be New Amsterdam. So the Dutch actually sold the island of Manhattan to the English, and that's how it became New York. So while there was a history happening here, there was also a history happening on the other side and on the other shores as well. And it's up to us to connect those histories. It's us, up to us to connect those histories because our history is in both places. And today we see the African story is being told without the African diaspora. And many times the African diaspora story is being told without the African. And over 350 million Africans live outside of the African continent. And the majority of them are outside because of what happened in these institutes. Over 60 of them are along the coast of West Africa. They used to be called the Gulf of Guinea. Out of the 60 of them, over 45 were in Ghana, the former Gold Coast, which shows you that this was the largest exit point of most of our ancestors. Millions of them came out, came out of the corridor of what we used to know as the Gold Coast and now Ghana. And that's why we're not surprised that many of us are making our return back through the same portal, back through the same gate, by coming back to Ghana. It's not by surprise that the spirit come upon Ghana that we celebrated the year of return in 2019. Brother Diallo and myself played a major role in helping to sell that idea to the government that we will be commemorating that in unison with those of us in the United States of America. And so that actually opened up a gate in the door for people who had never taken a decision before to travel here back home. And unfortunately, COVID came along and slowed that down. But that rebirth is being kindled again, and we're here. And numbers are coming even more. So our tour today, our experience today, will take place and begin with the condemned cell. We will go there first from the condemned cell. We go to the male dungeon. From the male dungeon, we'll walk this bulwark. See, see here in the cannonball, we talk about the competition needs to go on between Europeans who possess this territory. And then we'll go through the 
proceed the male, the female dungeon. And after the female dungeon, we will go through the door of no return, and then we will defy all of the odds and come back through that door of return. I say defy all the odds because we cannot count the number of conspiracies and the amount of investment and the billions of dollars that was put into separating Africa out of our mind. That we'd never think about Africa again. That we'll never come back to Africa. That we'll never make that journey and return back home. And yet our presence here defies all of that here this evening. And for every time any African returns back from across those waters and comes back over here, we have defied those odds. We have defied those odds and we have the ancestors who applaud us and they welcome us every time we come on these shores because again they know their dreams have been made real it's come true so that is the experience that we're walking in today um, we have a museum that is not functioning right now that is on this first upper floor here um, it's under reconstruction so we won't visit there we have upstairs here the palava hall the palava hall is where they sign documents the documents that actually constitute this kind of property this is where they signed indentures we made us they call it indentured servants, but we were slaves or enslaved. But the indentures like property is sold. We buy and sell land in the United States of America. You have your bill of sales, you know, you have your title, you have your deeds. But here, when you buy land, they give you an indenture. It's property. And that's how they registered us. They registered us as property. This is where it was done. This is where it was determined what brand would be put on you, what fire brand would be put on you according to what owner bought you and made you their property. And we will we will always talk about that because again that room is empty now too. It's going to be redesignated, so we won't visit there. But I have to point it out to you and tell you what is uh, what is there. Behind you or in front of you, depending on your position, is the mess hall of the soldiers. Often they talk about the North Atlantic slave trade. Many of us call it the war against Africa and African people. Trade suggests that something even was going on, even bartering was going on, fair sale was going on, but it wasn't the case. This is where the war perpetrated against Africa and African people that has not ceased, the occupants were there. So we call them mercenaries, and soldiers occupied these halls. That was their mess hall. Over here was the governor's quarters. Some of those areas are not safe today because they're preparing the floor to go in some restoration. So again, we won't visit there. We have to point it out to you. If we were to go into the Elmina Fort and Dungeon, and the female, where they kept the female quarters of our mothers and our daughters and our aunties enslaved, they actually had the governor's bedroom there, and his quarters were there, that you had a back staircase directly from the female quarters going up to his bedroom. Not up to his apartment, up to his bedroom. The stairs are still there. His balcony outside of his quarters there was where he could watch all of our women bathe, so he could take his choice amongst the women while they were bathing. These are the things that you would have experienced if you were there. Here, they have the governor's quarters right here. So the similar actions took place, but the composition and the structure of the edifice is different. So I'm trying to just add the narrative as if you were there too, along with here. So when we come back through that door of return, that will actually complete the cycle of our journey. But prayerfully, in the narrative of each one of those sites that we go to, you will get a full and a complete experience of what it is to return back here to be in the last place or a similar place like this that our ancestors touched base on this soil. This is what they knew. That was the last impression in their mind. We have to remember when they were captured, they didn't understand the language of their captives. They didn't understand the crime that they had committed. They didn't stand before any judge. They didn't stand before any court. They were just captured every day and every night. Every evening and every morning was a mystery in their life because nobody gave them no itinerary. Nobody told them what the next hour was going to be. Nobody told them when there was going to be a lunchtime or breakfast time, if there were any. Every day was a nightmare. Every moment was in darkness, even if it was light. And there was no light in the daytime and no light in the nighttime in reference to what was their destiny and what was their journey. So we try to take ourselves back there, if we can, just but for a moment, take ourselves back there. And this is not to visit any unnecessary pain, but there's no shame here. Because what we experience here is a testimony to the resilience of our people and the substance that we're made out of. So we come away from here with a sense of victory. We come away from here with a sense of endurance. We come away from here with a sense of pride. And we wear that. We don't apologize for any emotions. We don't apologize for any tears. We don't apologize for any feelings. What we do is stand on who we are. We stand on that history. We stand on that heritage. And we stand on it proudly. 
because it is what made us who we are and is why we survive, is why we still rise, and is why we still go on. Amen. I say. Hallelujah. Now, family, you see it just simply says sell. But this has much more meaning than what this sign conveys. It looks brand new because it is new. It was just made over a couple of years ago. The original symbol that was here, it fell off after all of this time. It was skull and bones. That's what the original symbol was here. There were no words. Skull and bones represented that it was a condemned cell. When you entered here, it was a death sentence. It was a death sentence by starvation. No water, no food. You didn't leave here unless you were dead. If there's more than one person here, you didn't leave here until the last person died. So you can be in here conceivably for days with, a, with dead corpses around you if you were not alone. If you were alone, they made sure that you were dead beforehand. No ventilation or anything. What seems like ventilation here was not for our ancestors. But if you see, when we go in here, there's two other doors. These two other doors were, if there were any of their own soldiers here that acted up, created any crime whatsoever, then they were put in here as a matter of discipline, put them close to those who were condemned in here. Not with us, but close to us. So they were locked up in the forefront of here for maybe 24 hours or 48 hours. They had some breathing room here. They can talk here. They had like a cell. They have these bars. But behind here is a door. And that door, behind that door, is where we were. And there was no ventilation. There were no bars. There was no light. So when we go in here, the evening is setting. So it's going to be dark. So you don't see the semblance of the sunlight that you might see if you're in the height of the day. But we didn't see that sunlight. That's an illusion because the doors are missing. But they had only pure darkness. We'll have a light bulb in there. And we're going to have the light bulb turned off when we go in there to see the semblance of the darkness that's in there. It is going to feel. It won't stay in there long. But the one to two minutes that we're in there, you can only imagine what it was to be in there for days waiting for you to starve to death. They could have been put before a firing squad. They could have been killed in any number of ways. But that would have been too good a death for those who were trying to break their spirit and set them as an example for those who refused to cooperate. So that's why they were meant to starve to death. And after they starved to death, like most of our other ancestors who died in other ways, they just simply threw them overboard for sharks to eat them, for shark food. So we're going to go inside here and pay a moment of silent tribute to those who did perish in this cell and still celebrate the resistance and those who refused to cooperate with their own incarceration, with their own captivity, with their own enslavement. They refused to cooperate. And we celebrate that because, again, throughout every age of our history, it is those who refuse to cooperate with our own marginalization, with our own captivity, that has allowed us to have the liberties that we have today, and still we struggle. Watch your head because it's a very low ingress, so watch your head. And notice the double door structure. Watch your head. Watch your head. special choices of the dungeon and they want to lay reefs in. And of course, because this is the most brutal and the cruelest, many people want to just lay their wreath here in commemoration of those souls and those spirits that died. And pitch black darkness is where they were. They can only hear the moans and the groans of each other. They only hear, again, because of the 
non-communicable languages in terms of them not understanding the language of their captives. Many times they didn't even understand that they were here for the death sentence. They didn't even understand they were here to starve to death because they couldn't translate that. All they know they were in another cell. All they know they were in a smaller dungeon. All they know is the brutality that was inflicted upon them to even bring them in here by force, that it was a different chapter. All they know is that they missed a day and a night with no food for first day. They missed a day and a night with no food for second day. Because a lot of what was going on had to still be translated by body language and by spirit and by perception, by intuition. Not that it was anybody's obligation to make you understand anything other than you have to obey a command. That you're under my charge. So we're simply going to give a moment of silence because we're going to go through three dungeons through this exercise. This is the first of them. In our silence, we thank them for not being silent. We'll proceed. It's it's yes. Crazy. And you see, it's moments, as I said. Not even three moments, three minutes. And you can feel again just the congestion, the sweat. And when you go outside, you immediately appreciate the fresh air and the light, although it's evening here. But the fresh air, we have a light on in here. In fact, we're supposed to cut that light off at least for 30 seconds. Now we get an impression. Hmm. narratives written by Plano. He wrote that when they met the Europeans, he was captive. He told the story. He was on the plantations in America. He escaped to Europe, became a free man, became a part of the abolition movement. But one of the first impressions he got, he said he'd never seen Europeans before. He didn't know who they were, what kind of human beings they were. He didn't know whether they were preparing them for food, for them to eat him, for them to ravage him. His imagination ran wild with the cruelest of ideas of what his future and his destiny would be. So we have to, again, try to imagine that you have no imagination of what your expectation should be of the next moment of your life. And these are not people who were enslaved, free people enslaved, and to take away a person's freedom. Light. When you come out, breathe that fresh air. Watch your head, too. As you see here is the male dungeon. This is where they kept our men, our fathers, our uncles, our brothers, our sons, our friends, our comrades. This is where they kept them. 
This is where they stored them. We will see when we go down here, it's going to be a descent. And this descent that we go into is more than just a physical descent into a dungeon, into darkness. It's also figuratively and spiritually. I like to remind people that during this whole episode in history, and all of those who were captured and enslaved here, not one single African American was captured. Not one single Jamaican was captured. Not one single Brazilian was captured, or Panamanian, or Trinidadian. We were captured in our original identities, as the people that we were, with our original languages, our original ethnic groups. And this is where you were stripped of that. You weren't just stripped of your garments and your clothing, of what they show us in all the narratives of slavery, seeing Africans being brought from jungles with no clothes on through a bush, having their ankles and their wrists and their necks bounded together. They never show us in our regalia, in our clothes, in our garments, in our jewelry, in our ornaments, because to show that, we show our humanity, we show our culture, show that we were people. And they couldn't sell the narrative that we came out of jungles. They couldn't sell the narratives that we were subhuman. So it changed the whole narrative. And to change the narrative, they had to take our humanity away. And to take our humanity away, they could only do it by taking our identity away. Because our humanity is in our identity. So they couldn't say who the African was. Here is when they began to reconstruct our identities. Here is where they manufactured the Negro. A thing just called black. Mm -hmm. Something they just labeled Negro black. No Asante, no Fanti. No Airway, no Fulani, no Hausa, no God. They portrayed us in another image in the world today, still don't know who we are. They never examined, they believed their own constructed, reconstructed narratives. This is where they stripped us. Later on, they stripped the whole African continent of who they were. Sat down and called the people here the Gold Coast after a piece of metal. But who knows the name of the people who will make up the Gold Coast? What do they call their names? What are the languages they speak? Next door they call us an elephant tusk, ivory coasters. Who are the people of an ivory coast? Who are the ethnic groups? What is their language? What is their culture? What is their heritage? Nigeria is called the slave coast. Nigger area. Cameroon means shrimp. Because some European goes there and see the biggest shrimp prawns you ever seen, and name the whole place shrimp, and we make an anthem out of it. We make a pledge of allegiance to it. We make a flag for it, because somebody else renamed us. And we raise up generations under these false identities, under these false names, and now we've got children who don't even know who they are. And people come to Africa, they don't know who the African is. The 350 million people out there call themselves African American, and Jamaican, and Trinidadian, they built new cultures. They built new ways of life to the point that it obscured who it is that they came from, who it is that they were. No history book teaches that. No history teacher teaches that. We became lost in somebody else's imagination, somebody else's reconstruction. And then when you go through some experience and try to find your heritage and who it is that you are, people still scorn you for that, make fun of you for that. But again, they forget the strength of the DNA of the people who went into these dungeons. They forget that and still we rise. And still in that DNA, something cried out for us to know who it is that we are and call us back to our right mind. And we're still on that journey. So we're going to descend into these dungeons and we're going to go through these chambers in here and we're going to look at what it was. We're going to look at what it is and we're going to feel and connect with a portion of what our ancestors felt and connected with down here. So watch your step. Because it's a slippery slope going down here. It's not even going down here, but it's not easy. It was never easy, and it will not be easy, and it shouldn't be made easy. And that's why we're taking this journey. Third step. It's the most uneven, so watch it. This third step as well, all right? And it's a slope, so be careful. Again, this is not just the dope. With the slave trade in full swing, by the time of the 
17th century, 1600s. When this began to be built, this was the high trade. This is what brought Europe her wealth. Watch your step going in here. This is the first chamber of the five in this particular edifice of a male dungeon. Each one of these doors had iron bars on them that opened up as gates that separated the populations. In this room alone, of the 300 men we kept in here. I've been in here with as many as 120, 125 at a time. And it's, you, you don't see any possible way that you can lay down and fit another person in here. But of the 300, because these places worked on a schedule, a schedule of ships coming to take loads across those waters, if there was a delay of the ship for whatever reason, it caused the congestion in these rooms because they just packed us and they brought us down from the interior. So if the ship was delayed, it meant that there was an oil spill here. And because some people had different philosophies about, you know, um, numbers and packing ships, some talk about loose pack, some talk about tight pack, that there could be population left in here up to two to three cycles without being taken out of here. They emptied them from the far room which we were landing in. So that room being emptied out, and they shipped everybody down, they bring a fresh crew in here. They emptied them out from the far front, the next room down, they bring a fresh crew in here. This is where they did everything. If you see this floor here, the cobblestone, each one of the floors in this edifice has its cobblestone. But it's the only floor that's been excavated, so you can see the real floor. When they excavated, they marked the floors. So when the floors had markings, and they would come up to here. So they had to dig down to see the original floor to see the cobblestone. So what we stood on in the condemned cell, and what we walked on when we came down here, was actually decades and centuries of residue of blood, sweat, tears, piss, shit, vomit, everything. And this is where they had to sleep. This is where they had to stand, squat. Everything done in this room. This is supposed to be the trenches carried out in the urine. This is supposed to be a larger trench where you had to go and squat, so-called the number two. Of course, we had no privacy, of course, we know it was spill over. These things weren't cleaned out often. And when you and when I said these things were overloaded, like here, they were been excavated, all of these were covered. And when they became covered eventually, there was no way for any of this to find its way out in a natural way. The only thing that was put in here that was provided like animals was straw. And straw is absorbent. Because of absorbent, it ends up housing that stench, that smell of whatever it is. It also is the embodiment of generational diseases that came of a people that used to be healthy, to be subjected to such inhumane, unsanitary conditions. Because if you know anything and you watch the patterns today, in the culture today, in all the deprivation, even in the poverty, even in the poorest village, you'll see children that are sent out to a water hole twice a day, in the morning and the evening, to get a bucket of water to bath. That's how important cleanliness is in the African culture. They'll walk a mile to a water hole to get water to bathe. So you can't imagine the violation of not being able to be clean. Contrary to how people try to portray us, cleanliness was a part of the normal culture. So you see holes on the walls here. Some of them are uh, holes that represent when they had chains and chains some people up against the wall here. You see, there were times they would send people in here, other enslaved Africans who had other duties to bring them in, to bring some food and provisions. But when they come in, you weren't fed rations on the assembly line. They put food in here like animals. So everybody had to fight for what they can get. So make it like only the strong survive, a dog against dog. Times it wasn't safe. They considered it wasn't safe. They could throw food down from these vents up here. And you still have to fight for it. 
This is the only ventilation, the only light. Because they're not light as much as you can't see it. The only light, the only ventilation. And they have crossbars there to make sure that you can't try to climb up here or put some smaller person through there. And if you did on the other side, it's such a long wall and drop that you only went to your death. And most people didn't know where they were because they were taken from the interiors. They never saw the sea. They never heard the ocean. So when the waves of the ocean come up and hit these big rocks here, it sounds like thunder. So you didn't know what was going on. You didn't know whether the gods were so angry with you that there's their voice out there speaking to you, cursing you with this presence and what is going on with you. You pray for a miracle. You call on all the gods that you know. And yet you're still, you're locked up in this fate. You're locked up in this destiny that you have no idea. You can't even call it destiny because you haven't reached the end yet. You don't know where you're going. You don't know what the center is. You don't know what the parameters are. You don't know what your lane is. You don't know anything because your world has been shattered. Your reality has been interrupted. And everything it is that you use to measure what reality is has been broken down. There is no reality. So as we stand in here, we give another moment of silence for all of the men, not only those who were in here, who survived, who chose life, as I said, who chose not to die. That was a choice. But you could have rose up with cause, with justification, and been killed, rightfully so. You could have chosen to take your own life. You had choices, but they chose to live not knowing what tomorrow would bring. They chose to live so that we can be. So I tell every young person and older person, there is no reason, no excuse for failure, no mediocrity, nor to give up in life. Because if our ancestors chose to live under these conditions, not knowing what tomorrow will bring, is because of that choice we are. Failure is not an option. Mediocrity is not an option. Because it would be a total disgrace to the sacrifice of our ancestors to be less than we have the potential to be. So that moment of silence is for those who were physically in these dungeons and chose life, and it's for those who used their life after these dungeons, and the struggle that still continues to this day, we give tribute to them. Okay. Yeah. Watch your step. Watch your step. Now, now you know what you're walking on. Again, bars are on all these sections here to separate them. There's no free movement between the spaces. All the spaces constitute a designated area. Once you take note of this 
chamber here. We're still talking about the same numbers in each one of these chambers. This chamber here, the acoustics of this place is such that the voice travels. They would have a bilingual African here who understood many of the dialects of the peoples who were traveling out in the various areas and territories. His job was to say what was being spoken about here, what was going on here, and what is the temperament. So you see, even in the early stages, it always took someone to be able to work in behalf of our captives to be able to keep us marginalized, keep a step ahead of us, and to always know what it is that we're thinking and what's going on. So that's what that chamber represents. Again, the same ventilation um, holes here. That are up there, the only light, only source of fresh air, um, if you can call it that. And even sometimes the rainwater found itself filtering into these places here. They kept the dampness in the bones, you know, the um, seized generational illnesses, the rheumatism, the asthma, all of these things, even across those borders, the stated families that were not indigenous to the African populations and our natural habitats. Yeah, I'm never, but I'm, I'm only focused on that. Yeah, I can say you know, so. the cross bars hanging right out there have not totally uh, deteriorated. Most of them are rusted out. These two, you still see the cross bars there. If you were to uh, have a little more light, you would see the cross bars out there. But again, population no less than 150, most of the time between 300 to 500. And again, you can only see squatting, standing, laying against the wall, but to lay down, there's no room. Coming to the last chamber. Here is the last chamber. And also we have here a traditional shrine. And each one of our shrines, they have a guardian spirit in here, and the deity that is here, the Tabia. This was always a sacred place way before the Europeans came here and started to build the temples. When they occupied this place, they called the spiritualists, the priests, to remove the shrine from this place to another place in town for safekeeping. When Ghana gained their independence and gained control back over this edifice, the priests also performed the necessary rituals to bring the shrine back here. This is the priest that keeps the shrine. He gives the blessings to those who come in here, he pours libations on our behalf, and asks for a blessed and peaceful um, trip and journey here, and that the blessings of the ancestors are with you. That's what he's going to perform here right now. I'll continue the narrative of what this place represents further. So, in simply, as I said, you give a blessing to those of us who travel here that we uh, receive well here, have a safe journey, safe travel back. You also call upon some of the names of some of the gods and the deities that are guardians of this land here over our traditional area. It is believed that they have. 
times 77 plus 7, God's here. They don't say 84 because the number 7 is sacred. So in that respect, um, he just paid um, that tribute. And we don't want to be no misinterpretation. People will come away from here thinking Africa works with stones and rocks and trees and everything. But it's not so. You know, every single major Western religion is copied from the African spiritual science. And we call it African spiritual science. We say African spirit, African religion, it still gives a Western connotation to it. This is our spiritual science. We know how to connect ourselves, our living spirit, with the universe, with the earth, with the waters, with the wind, with the trees. You see, the holiest site in Jerusalem is owned by the Muslims. Jews would like to take control of it, but right now it's owned by the Muslims. It's called the Dome of the Rock. That's where Solomon built his temple. It's the Dome of the Rock because they built the mosque around the rock because the place is sacred. That is what they believe King Solomon slaughtered thousands of oxen and sheep and goats to dedicate the first temple of Solomon. That's where they slaughtered those animals and poured libation to dedicate the temple of the Most High. But it's the rock that's sacred. They believe that Muhammad ascended to heaven and Pegasus, the flying horse, from that rock. You see in Mecca, they have a black stone. They believe in the meteorite. And that black stone is inside that Kaaba. They hold that black stone sacred. They love to go just to touch it, just to kiss it. That's African spiritual science. They believe in Abraham, Ishmael, built an altar to God there. These are all relics of African spiritual science. That the world has castigated African spiritual science, but they've taken what they wanted out of it. When you hear the story of Jacob leaving his mother and father, they went to go visit his uncle Laban. They said he lighted upon a place, and he had a dream with a ladder. God ascending up into heaven. He saw angels ascending and descending on that ladder. And he woke up, he said, this is none other than the house of God. There was no building there. There was no monster there, no temple there. He got rocks and put them there. And he poured libation on those rocks and said, this is the house of God. He didn't say the rocks were God. He just said the place was sacred. When the Israelites left Egypt, they went to Mount Sinai. The mountain was sacred. The mountain was holy. We recognize his holy places. There's holy sites, but they've taken our African mind and our African sciences away from us and spooked us out with our own tradition. So we shouldn't walk away with a false interpretation of what we see here, what we experience here. We've come back here to recapture our mind. As I said, this is not a tour. This is an experience. So we come back here to experience Mother Africa. We come back here to touch base with our ancestors. We come back here to tell the story and to tell the narrative to the truth of our reality. Here is a passageway. That's a tunnel that is behind it. And it would take our ancestors out of this room to go through that tunnel, to come out near the door of no return where the women's quarters are. When the British outlawed the slave trade in 1807, part of the act was to seal this front and to seal the back. Some of us are trying to get the government open up so we can go through the full experience of what it was to go through that tunnel. We're going to have to go back outside to talk about that tunnel and how it leads to the other side. We can't go through it. So the British were following slavery in 1807. They didn't do it because they were doing a humanitarian act. They did it because they wanted to punish the newly independent United States of America, who had won the Revolutionary War. And they knew that if they cut America off from coming to Africa and getting new cargo to help build up their economy after the war, they would maybe starve them off. So that's why they outlawed the slave trade, but not slavery. But slavery went on in the British colonies in 1834, before they abolished slavery on August 1st. But it was, again, to cut off the United States. That's why they came back and attacked the White House in 1812 and burned it down before they had to rebuild it again. So if you put the time sequences together, they were really trying to punish the United States of America. So in that respect, that's why they outlawed the slave trade. But then they developed a more heinous practice. They started taking the strongest of the African men and the strongest of the African women and they made the men studs and the women breeders, and they went around to breed our people to compensate for not being able to get new African blood from the African continent. Mm -hmm. So they made all of our strongest women breed like every year you had to give birth. Every year, whether it's 25 children, 30 children, if you can have them, you made, you had to have them. And they would transfer men from plantation to plantation just to impregnate breeders. That was a direct act of not being able to come to Africa to get brand new bodies and brand new cargo. So this is all part of what they don't say in the history books. But one of the great things that's about this narrative is that the forefathers, the ancestors, the gods of the land did not allow us to travel alone. So they didn't just take human bodies out of here. 
Many of the gods of Africa travel with us to the Americas. That's why we're able to do the phenomenal feats that we're able to do and accomplish the things we're able to accomplish under the most horrendous conditions. The gods became us, we became the embodiment of those gods that left here with us. They got on the ships with us. They got off the ships with us. They was in these dungeons with us. And that's why people still don't understand the strength, the indomitable strength and endurance of the black man today. Some people even felt that we didn't feel pain. They even thought of ideas how to stretch the limits of the pain that we could endure to see if we can survive. And out of all of that, out of all that testimony, today as we stand here, Africa has the largest and the youngest population in the world. More African youth than any other continent in the world under those conditions. And look at the millions who perish and look still what God has done. It's almost like the, uh, one of the comedians said, we don't die, we multiply. <laughs> under those horrendous conditions. But again, we celebrate our resilience. We celebrate our strength. So in that respect, um, for those who inspired um, an illegal donation to the priests of the people that try and keep the tradition alive here, we're going to go upstairs. Every year, you'll see in this corner, more recently over here, every year um, we celebrate Emancipation Day. And we have a reverential evening before the day, which is on July 31st. So we come down here, we light seven candles. That's what we talk about, we turn upside down, we get candles in them. We light seven candles here, we lay reefs here, and every other year we celebrate Panafest, the Pan African Historical Theater Festival, which brings many of our brothers and sisters from the other side to come here to also um, experience Mother Africa. And so we perform these rituals down here every July 31st from sundown to midnight. And he's also a part of that. We have chiefs, judicial rulers, government officials, the official delegations in the diaspora, they all come here to perform that ritual here every July 31st. For all of our brothers and sisters, those who perish in the villages, being attacked and being raided, for those who perish from the trek coming down here, for wild animals, insects, diseases, for those who perish in these dungeons, for those who perish in the Middle Passage, for those who perish in the plantations, for those who killed, who killed in the insurrections, and for those who continue to die for the liberation, emancipation, and total freedom of our people. Those are the seven candles that we light down here every year. So we will proceed back to the courtyard and we will continue our journey to the female dungeon and the result will return and we will all return. It was not planned this way, but this is it turned into an evening program. And most of the movement of our ancestors were done in the evening, done uh, in the darkness, so that the people around wouldn't see what was being done. And um, 209, former President Barack Obama, First Lady Michelle Obama, and the family came here to visit. It was a short notice, so people didn't know what to do as a tribute of his visit here. So we decided that they would lay this plaque. So they laid this plaque here. But the guy who gave them the tour, very good friend, he described the tour and some of the emotions going through the tour. And he said that as for the family at the various points, they showed emotional, you know, um, signs during the narrative. But it wasn't until President Barack Obama came out and the guy said, this was the church above the male dungeon. And the first time he showed that emotion, like, what? You mean this was the 
church on top of the male dungeon with all the moaning and the groaning, even the stench and the smell and the suffering and people could be upstairs worshiping God or as they say, with no second thought at all. And that brings us to this next site here. We have the only marked grave. This, this whole courtyard is a graveyard for many of the soldiers. Many of the soldiers, they were known to perish from malaria. Some say that the black man should build a monument to the mosquito <laughs> because he was our chief ally. So they started naming West Africa the white man's graveyard. They could not stand malaria and they would die off. So this is Governor McLean and his wife grave over here and another um, white head, another soldier over here. And this is the only African grave marked here. It is believed that <clears throat> Governor McLean he was here alone, and his wife came to join him. When his wife came to join him, it seemed he had taken on an African mistress, and that messed her all up. So we have two narratives. One was that she committed suicide because she couldn't stand the fact that her husband was an African woman. The other was that she was poisoned. And so both stories still float around. Um, but this is Philip Kwaku. Philip Kwaku's father was a rich man, rich by implications of making money on the slave trade and collaborating. And his father desired for his son to have a European education. That turned into him being sent to Europe and studying the clergy. What the Europeans felt that they had a very small success story in converting our ancestors to Christianity. Because the people looked at their character and their lifestyle. And how can you convert me to worship your God and you're a murderer, you're a raper, rapist, you know you're a liar, and you want me to convert and understand your God? And then the other thing was the communication problem. So they felt that it would be more advantageous if they would convert one of the, uh, convert one of us and ordain him and then let him bring the gospel to us. And so that was his purpose. So he was the beginning of the Anglican Church here. The first ordained priest of the Anglican Church, African priest of the Anglican Church. You had another one, Capitan, uh, Yohannes and Elmina, and he was the first ordained of the Dutch Reformed Church. His story is a little more hideous in the sense that he ended up committing suicide because of the contradictions. He wanted to marry an African woman, they wouldn't allow him. He saw most of the people drunkards and all of that. Then they forced a European prostitute on him as a priest to marry her. The contradictions were too great. Eventually he committed suicide. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, as I said, this grave, this yard here, if any of the European soldiers died, they could be buried in this courtyard. So some years back, they excavated some of the remains, brought them back to the US. And so we understand that, you know, this whole courtyard is full of remains, but not us. If we died here, we were thrown overboard, like I said earlier, to the shocks. But he's the only African grave that's been identified here, as the only African buried here. It also started one of the first schools here and uh, propagating the gospel. In fact, that was the mission, propagating the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in that respect, this is the beginning of the church in Ghana, was through him. But this was the church they were in. Now it's a library. So you can put all the pieces together. Um, that's a whole nother narrative in and of itself. such gold before the possession of a human being. He broke the stock markets of the world. People were asking the source of that gold. The source of that gold was West Africa. West Africa at that time had one of the highest standards of living, trading with gold coins, minted gold coins. And so both Arabs and Europeans wanted to find the source of that gold. And unfortunately, they brought them down to this concentrated area. They came here to rob us of our wealth. Europe was poor. It was, it was, it was, um, coming out of the Black Death disease. So many of them had died during the Black Death disease. They came down to West Africa because of the rumors and the source of gold and the rumors and the source of sailors who knew how to navigate the Atlantic Ocean. And I started to say that story earlier. So Mansa Musa came to the throne of Mali because his uncle Abubakar II abdicated the throne. And how did he abdicate that throne? He took 2,000 ships from West Africa to the Americas, 180 years before Columbus. And that's why they knew that they were navigators 
who had the knowledge of the Atlantic Ocean that would sail from West Africa all the way to the Americas, and that's why Columbus stopped in West Africa before the Americas, rather than going from Europe to the Americas. Well, I can see Africans use the risking their lives on the Mediterranean, trying to swim across the ocean, overpacking boats. They're going there to change their lives, to change their destiny. They're going there hoping they can get jobs and get money. Take care of their families. But that's what Europeans did to risk their lives to come to West Africa because they can come to West Africa, they can change their destiny, they can get wealth, they can get money, they can change their life. And that's why Europe has money today and Africa doesn't because they came down here to loot and to rob Africa. This is the tunnel that they would have sentinels watching us. As we pass through the underground tunnels, I told you when they sealed that door up, these are the underground tunnels that have sentinels here watching to make sure we kept it moving. Because when you were moving through here, you were moving to the ship. They didn't want nobody to stand still, they didn't want no backing up. again our female dungeons. I'm only stopping here to show you that there is a little more ventilation here. A little more ventilation in that they had the pipes. You see the holes there, the iron bars there. More ventilation. Not that they gave our women any humane treatment. Not that they gave them any consideration. It's only because of their desire of them to enjoy them. Most of these ships that came with these Europeans came without their women. So they had their way with our women. And then these two cells on both sides of the wall here, we kept up to 150 of our women in here at the time. That was what is described on the book. We you know what I told you, the overcrowding, the, the hesitation or the delay of any shift caused an overcrowd. So before we go to the door, we're going to return another schedule. We have to step in here and pay tribute to our mothers and our daughters and our aunties.
1994, they had a special conference on these edifices because we found it was one renovation. They changed some of the mail cells and one later to a gift shop. We were Here's where they separate, sought to separate us forever from the African continent. Here is where they assigned us to so-called new worlds. When our ancestors started being taken out of here, there was no United States of America. There was no Canada. There was no Brazil. There was none of the places that we call today the places that we call them. They simply called it the new world. And we've been taken to a new world, a new world that hadn't been created yet. And that was the job, the responsibility that we had. We created new worlds out there that they don't give us credit for. Now they have names. Now they're the destination of people of the world. Now everybody wants to travel there. But we went there to actually build new worlds. So when we look upon Mother Africa today, we look upon the situation in Africa today, when we say that we want to build a new Africa, if we want to build a new Africa in our own image, in our own life as African people, nothing is impossible. But look at the worlds, the worlds that we built out there. That was just five or six hundred years ago. Nothing. And look at what has been taken on our sweat, on our blood, and on our labor, and on our intelligence, and on our spirit, and on our swagger. Look what we've done. And there's nothing outside of our hand. They want to make a lot of we just brute bronze, that we just carry burdens. We just dug ditches. But it was our intelligence. It was our spirit. What does it take to give a spirit to a land? Who can put the value of putting a spirit to a land? Who can put the value of giving a land a soul? The way that we have done. The people come to any part of that world, they come to see the African spirit that we brought there from here. We didn't create out of a vacuum. We took it from somewhere and brought it to somewhere. And that's why I say even the African gods travel with us. And they move with us. And they still move with us. And that's who we are. So we're going through this door of no return. And we're going to thank the Most High God that has been with us all through the ages and still with us now. In the spirit of our ancestors who are with us in our DNA, who are us. And we thank God for that and we're going to walk back to that door of return. Proud. Here we have steps that were not always here. These steps were made in 1998. And this new dock that you have here is just being built the last two and a half years. We used to be able to walk down and go straight to the ocean. But they just, the new World Bank project, they're building a whole new 
caught here. And so you can no longer walk right directly into the ocean. But these steps were built here because of the remains that you saw in the same month. When we brought the remains back here in 1998, one came from the African burial ground in New York, and one came from Jamaica, Bristol. That's where we visited. And when we brought them in, we brought them from Accra to a village close to here called Abanzi. And then when they got down at Abanzi, they wanted to mount them on boats so we can bring them back through the sea the way our ancestors left. And so we had all the fishermen around this area line make a corridor. And they brought those remains through that corridor to come back through here. And they made these stairs so that when we carried the coffins, we could carry them up there without stumbling. So it was just a rough you know, decline here. I happened to come in with the remains from Jamaica. And um, so I saw the audience of people that were here waiting to receive us. From all the way from as far as about a half hour from Salt Pond along the bank of all the rivers, all the villages came out and lined up in red and black to wave the ancestors on, you come home, you come home. And so when we came back here, they named this door the door of return. And all that goes down. And they brought them to the door of return. And from that ritual, they've been calling us home. From that time. Even though we proclaimed the year of return 2019, it was in 1998 when they were marrying this door the door of return. And they took the spirit of the people to the call the sons and daughters of Africa. We know that errors preceded that. Kwame and Koma and all of them brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers who came and made this journey. Who we're walking on their path. And each one of this path has different episodes to it. And we also bring our part. So one of the episodes that go on the path of the generation of the right now. So this is the path of the family. This is the work that has been put into motion by our ancestors. And this is the experience of the journey that we're on. And I know this evening we have been next to celebrate that and I think that we deserve to do a clap in this night and the ancestors don't usually get disturbed in the evening but we're going to clap because we're going to claim the victory of having returned and the ancestors have welcomed us home. So we So, Prabha, um, that's for those of us coming back to the door.